If you haven't seen my video on relative atomic mass and abundance, have a look at that first. But if you have, then you should remember that, of course, we have something like chlorine and its relative atomic mass is 35.5 because that's an average of the isotopes that we find according to their abundance. Most are 35, some are 37, so they average out to 35.5. But if we have a lump of chlorine or carbon or whatever it is in front of us, how do we find out what isotopes are in this lump of stuff and in what abundance? Enter mass spectrometry. Basically, we use an electric or a magnetic field to exert a force on ions which will move differently according to their mass. Now, there are a range of mass spectrometers out there, machines that can do this. One such mass spectrometer looks like this. We take our atoms or our molecules, could be those as well, and we ionize them. And so we send in our ions into the mass spectrometer. And we can do that by two ways. Electrospray ionization. What we do is apply a high voltage when it's dissolved and it gains a H plus ion. So therefore it becomes positively charged. Or electron impact ionization. The substance is vaporized then bombarded with electrons, which knock off an electron. So in both cases, they gain a charge of plus one. Well, when we say plus one, plus 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. In other words, just plus one electron charge, just positive instead of negative. We could call that one E. So we know now that these ions are going to be positively charged, but we want to accelerate them. How do we do that? Well, we do that with an electric field that exerts a force and that's due to the cathode that we have, just a piece of metal, negatively charged, we might have positively charged one back here to repel it. So the electric field is going to accelerate the ions towards the negative plate, the cathode, and they're gonna go through the hole in the middle. So there we go. All of the ions experience the same force. If the force is the same, but the mass is different, then they're going to accelerate at different rates. So we can say that lighter ions accelerate more than heavier ones. Makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got a, a two liter engine in a car and then in a lorry, well, they've got the same force, but of course the car is gonna end up going faster after accelerating for the same amount of time. And then these ions just drift through the mass spectrometer. Of course, this has to be a vacuum, doesn't it? Because we can't have these ions bombing into even gas particles that are there. So yes, this does have to be a vacuum. And then finally, we have our detector here. All of these ions are going to collide with the detector. So how does the detector detect different masses? Well, it's because lighter ions will arrive before heavier ones. And so that means the detector can say, oh, I've got a light one. Oh, this one's come a little bit later. That means that it's this much heavier, etc." They just use a little bit of SUVAT for that. There are other kinds as well, ones that use magnetic fields. If you want to know more about these, then have a look at my magnetic fields video. But that's something for A-level physics. You don't need to know this in great detail for chemistry. What we do is have the ions coming out, and they're all going the same speed. And then we put them into this sort of curved track like this. What we do is have a magnetic field. And we can represent the magnetic field by crosses, showing that the magnetic field goes into the page. That makes the ions curve. The heavier ions are not going to curve as much as the lighter ones. They're feeling the same magnetic force. They're going to accelerate different amounts. And when it comes to circular motion, which this is, that means they're gonna take a different path. Then what we do is just have detectors at the end. So we can say that lighter ions curve more. So these detectors then each detect a specific mass. So they're set up that, oh, we can see that we can see that we have something that has a relative atomic mass of 35 hitting this detector and 37 hitting this detector. A variation on that one, we can have ions again, and again, going into a magnetic field. Again, I'm just showing it going into the page, but then we have a film, photographic film. If ions hit it, then it'll transfer energy to the film and it'll make a bright spot on it. These ions, when they go into the magnetic field, I should probably extend it down here, they go into curve round. And the heavier ones will curve around less than the lighter ones. The brighter the spot, that means the more ions there are hitting that point. So this one is heavier, this one is lighter. It's not as accurate as the previous one, of course, though, because with proper detectors, you can, of course, find out exactly what the abundance is 
of these irons hitting these detectors. When it comes to just a film and bright spots, it's a little bit of guesswork, isn't it? And so what we can do is get our results from this and plot a mass spectrum. So up the side, we'll have abundance. So 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100%. Now the x-axis, this can either be mass or it can be mass to charge ratio. In either case though, you're just gonna end up with the mass as it were, because what did we say was the charge on these ions that are going in? It's just gonna be one. So actually if we just take say 35 divided by one, then we're just gonna end up with 35. So don't worry too much about that. The point is that we need to see the difference between these. Also, if we're going for the electro spray ionization, well, we're actually adding a proton. So that means we're adding on a relative mass of one. So therefore, if we have a mass of seven, then we need to take one off because we're just concerned with what the H plus ion, the proton is attached to. But for now, let's just pretend we went with electron impact ionization. So these atoms have been ionized without changing their mass in any real sense. If this is chlorine, we'd have something like a line going up to 75% at 35, a mass of 35 or a mass charge ratio of 35. And then we'd have a line going to 25% for 37. This is what the mass spectrum would look like for most naturally occurring chlorine. So let's say we've got a lump of magnesium, naturally occurring magnesium, and what we've done is we've ionized some of it and put it through a mass spectrometer. Lo and behold, we have detected masses or mass to charge ratios of 24, 25, and 26, and we find their relative abundances are 79, 10, and 11% respectively. So the question is, what is the relative atomic mass? So just like earlier, when we thought about chlorine, all we do is take the decimal form of our relative abundance, times that by the mass, and then add them all up for all of the different isotopes that we have detected. And we end up with 24.3. So the relative atomic mass of naturally occurring magnesium is 24.3, because we have atoms with different numbers of neutrons, either 12, 13, or 14. So magnesium is always 12, atomic number of 12, because it has 12 protons, but actually the mass number, relative atomic mass, should be 24.3 if we want to be accurate, because that's what it averages out to when we take into account the relative abundance of the different isotopes. Now mass spectrometry is also useful because it can identify molecules, because this also works for complex or molecular ions. So let's say that we have a mass spectrum, and we find that we have a line at, well, we've got some gas, let's say. We ionize it, we put it through a mass spectrometer, and we find that we have a line at 44. Now, 44, what's that going to be? Well, 44 could be something like ruthenium, but we know that's not a gas, so this probably isn't going to be an atom. This is probably going to be a molecule, isn't it? Well, of course, we know that all gases are molecules unless they are the noble gases. So CO2, the relative molecular mass, or we can say MR, is equal to 12 plus two lots of 16. And so that gives us 44. So it's highly likely that this gas that we put in there is carbon dioxide. But we don't know for sure because that could be something else that adds up to 44 as well. Now we know that the CO2 is being ionized, don't we? So we can actually just say that, well, let's call this molecular ion M plus as a shorthand for the ion, for the molecular ion. However, what's weird is that we can actually end up with some other peaks as well. So let's say that we can have one at 12, we can have one at 16, we can have one at 28 as well. Hang on a minute, if we put pure CO2 into the mass spectrometer, why on earth do we have other peaks? Well, that's because these are from fragments. Fragmentation means you can end up with parts of the molecule being detected. So not all of the CO2 molecules will stay as CO2 plus as 44. They could split up into different bits. How could CO2 split up? Well, 44, we know that that's our CO2 plus. It's CO2, but it's lost an electron. Well, it has a relative atomic mass of 12. Well, carbon does. After all, everything's based off it, isn't it? So we can say that this peak is due to C. But of course it's going to be C plus because a carbon atom has come out, has been fragmented from the CO2 molecule somewhere, but we know it still has to be ionized if it's going to be detected. 16? Well, 16 is just oxygen, isn't it? So that could be O plus, and indeed it has to be. 28, 12 and 16, possible for 
a C and an O to break apart from the other oxygen and just be ionized themselves, just the two of them, and then that's detected. So these fragments, they might not seem useful, but actually they are, because it could be something else that adds up to 44, couldn't it? But we have 12, we have 16. Whatever this molecule is that adds up to 44, it has a carbon and it has an oxygen in it. So this can be used to identify molecules. Isn't that clever? So there we go, that's the basics of mass spectrometry and how it can be used to find relative abundance of isotopes and determine what molecules we have in a substance as well. Hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you have any ideas of what I could make next, then put it in a comment down below. See you next time.